You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with journalist and author Rachel Shabby and the political commentator Benedict Spence. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. The Observer has been investigating the state of prisons in England and Wales and reports that the vast majority are providing what inspectors call inadequate conditions and unacceptable treatment of inmates. The Sunday Express speaks exclusively to the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, who accuses Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer of trying to sabotage her plans to end the small boats migration crisis. The Times, meanwhile, says the Home Secretary now believes that the biggest threat to UK security is the Iranian state and its links to organised crime gangs in this country. The Mail on Sunday accuses bank and energy bosses of raking in more than £100 million in pay and bonuses by cashing in on the rising cost of living for their customers. The Sunday Mirror has Chef Jamie Oliver joining calls for the government to give struggling children free school meals all year round. The Sunday Telegraph leads with concerns expressed amongst ministers that technology in imported electric cars from China will be used to spy on UK citizens. The Sunday People reports that illegal nasal sprays that tan your skin but contain a chemical linked to cancer are being sold on TikTok. And finally, The Star leads with the news many have been waiting for, that the UK may at last start to get its long-awaited summer later this week. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by Rachel and Benedict. Welcome to you both. Let's start with the front page of The Observer and a story that, that we've been covering extensively today, and that is of uh, Imran Khan, who has been the erstwhile uh, Prime Minister of Pakistan, who has been arrested and uh, being handed down a three-year jail sentence. Rachel. Yeah, that's right. So within um, moments of this verdict uh, being passed with the court sentencing him, uh, he was speedily um, arrested just outside of Lahore, as you've been reporting. Um, this he has called for protests, um, protesters to come out on the streets to to protest this this arrest. Uh, he actually released a video um, quite movingly, saying, "You know, by the time you watch this video, I will have been arrested." He could see what was coming. Um, his supporters and his lawyers have um, accused the courts of operating a sham trial where he was not allowed to defend himself, where the evidence was not really properly aired. This is seen as being driven by a military which is keen to remove Imran Khan ahead of a forthcoming election. Um, he instigated a series of military reforms targeting the military, um, and this is viewed as a bit of a backlash against that. But obviously, lots of people in Pakistan um, very disappointed by this and will be expected to come out onto the streets to protest his treatment. Yes, he has called for people not to sit silently in, in their homes and to come out, but to peacefully protest. That's to be stressed, Benedict. <laughs> Yes, that's true. Um, although, you know, as often with these things, you know, there's only so much that he can do if, if his supporters feel that he has been unfairly treated or they feel that there are shenanigans going on behind the scenes, as he has often alluded to in the past, you know, talking about um, uh, uh, Pakistan's own secret services, uh, the CIA uh, being complicit in his downfall, in his removal, then who's to say what might happen because there has already been violence uh, in relation to uh, the actions being taken against uh, Imran Khan. People have been attacked, military installations have been attacked by his supporters, and he does have a lot of them. You know, he's very popular amongst um, great swathes of Pakistani um, uh, society, and it cuts, uh, uh, it cuts across region, it cuts across 
tribe, you know, he is uh, sort of unique in Pakistani politics of being, you know, at, at once part of the Pakistani establishment, but also able to sort of transcend it. Um, and I think this has to be seen, uh, frankly, as a, as a bit of a concern. Uh, whatever you may think of, of Imran Khan, this is the state, this is the apparatus of the state, and by that we mean the military, uh, reasserting its control over Pakistan. And, you know, it, there have been a number of military uh, governments in this country's history. It is not a country that has a particularly happy history. It is also a rather febrile one, and it is central to, to the future of the region. I know that obviously India will be looking at this with great interest. China has extensive economic interests uh, in Pakistan. Obviously, it is fighting an insurgency in the west of the country against the Pakistani Taliban. It, all is not well. Uh, in in Pakistan, so to have this sort of additional political upheaval, um, it does nothing for the stability. Obviously, the military sees in Ram Khan as a threat to the status quo as it currently is, but I can't imagine that things are going to get any less tense as a result of this. In Imran Khan denying all wrongdoing, uh, describing it as political victimization. Our own Foreign Secretary James Cleverly. Uh, looking at the developments closely. Let's have a look at the Express. Um, very bold headline on the Sunday Express. Sabotage, one word. Um, this is uh, what the Home Secretary is claiming, of the Labour Party, of their policies to, to stop the boats, the Conservative policies to stop the boats. The Labour Party is uh, sabotaging their efforts. That's the claim. Rachel. That is the claim coming from Swella Braverman, um, and it seems to be based on the fact that one of the people that is helping Keir Starmer shape his response and his policy on asylum um, was a lawyer that was opposed to the inhumane and, as it turned out, unlawful um, deportation of asylum seekers to Rwanda. Now, I think it's worth pointing out that this newspaper, along with a few others, is essentially taking part in um, the government's use of immigration and asylum as, as a culture war in the country. It's a, it's a wedge that it's trying to drive through the country. Um, and these things are basically damage limitation for a government that is on its knees, wildly unpopular in the polls, and seem to be failing across several measures, not least, um, you know, the cost of living crisis. Um, and the things that are damage limitation for the government electorally are actually quite damaging for this country and for other people. And its policy on asylum is a case in point. So it's small wonder that the Labour opposition will be trying to mitigate those effects. Um, everybody has a right, it's worth reiterating, to seek uh, asylum in the UK. And the one way that you can stop people taking boats to this country is to provide safe routes. The government is not doing that, um, but it, what it is doing is whipping up hatred and animosity over something that actually isn't, in the scheme of things, a big issue. Uh, and Benedict, interestingly, the um, Labour Party are actually accusing the government of being too slow to deport uh, failed asylum seekers. Uh, Shadow Home Secretary Eva Cooper is uh, quoted as saying that they would uh, pledge to speed up deportation if Labour comes to power? Well, actually, yes, I think that that's more the key point. It's not that Labour is trying to sort of right the wrongs of letting more people into the country to claim asylum. Labour is saying that one of the major issues that is causing a backlog in the asylum system is that this country no longer deports people, nowhere near on the scale that we used to, because I'm afraid there are lots of people who do come to this country who have no right to be here, but they find themselves sort of uh, gunk in a gunked up system. There is no real desire, I think, frankly, from this government um, to deport people. There is no real desire to get tough on any of this. And we have to go back to all of this and say, actually, immigration is, I think, actually a touchstone issue uh, uh, for many members of uh, the public who would tend to vote conservative. They are not going to be fooled by headlines like this. They're going to sit there and they're going to go, well, of course, human rights lawyers are going to intervene on the side of, of people who are claiming asylum. That's literally their job. What they will say is, correctly, the conservatives have been in power for 13 years, 
And almost every year that they have been in power, the number of uh, migration numbers, both legal and illegal, have gone up. And actually, the government has been entirely, it's been asleep at the wheel over this issue. And it is only now that people are really fed up with how it is being handled, that they've turned around and go, ah, oh, now, after, you know, in, our, in the 13th year of our reign, we will stop the boats. And it's Labour's fault. And everybody, I think, is turning around and going, well, no, they haven't been in power. You have. We can see what the numbers are. We can see what the correlations are. We're not buying your whole thing about, oh, well, this year there were a lot of uh, Ukrainians. This year there were a lot of Afghans. No, we can see what the numbers of, of Afghans are. We can see that they're not that high. You can't fob us off with this. And I understand that you know uh, the, the Express, the Telegraph, the Mail, uh, these papers will go hard on this. But I just think actually a lot of traditional Tory voters have lost faith in the government to take this issue seriously. They don't trust them to deport people. They don't trust them actually to settle them in suitable accommodation either. And I think that that's the thing, really. You've got the worst of both worlds, people who want more people to come to this country and those who want fewer. Neither of them really have any trust in this government to do either thing correctly. Uh, Rachel, we've only got about uh, 30 seconds. I was just going to talk about the Bibi Stockholm, uh, the barge uh, to house asylum seekers due to come online uh, next week. The Telegraph, um, got a quote from the Deputy Prime Minister, and he's saying that critics of the, the scheme um, should stop their howls of outrage. Oh, I'm absolutely going to keep howling about that. We're looking at a, at a barge that has been condemned by... Um, anyone with anything to do with concerns over human rights. It's also a health and safety risk. It's a fire hazard, and it's also being investigated over health and safety for things not to do with being a fire hazard, so additional reasons. I'm not going to stop howling about this inhumane boat that seeks that could potentially um, be a risk for people who are already vulnerable and have come to the UK in the hope of some kind of sanctuary. OK, Benedict, I don't know if you're going to howl, but we're going to have to wait for it until uh, after <laughs> the break. Uh, stay right where you are. Coming up, uh, we'll continue the press preview with Jamie Oliver's stark warning to governments over free school meals. That story in the Sunday Mirror. Do stay with us if you can. Welcome back. You are watching the press preview. Still with me, journalist and author Rachel Shabby and political commentator Benedict Spence. Welcome back. Let us have a look at the um, let's look at the Telegraph front page um, and this rather worrying headline. China will use electric cars to spy on Britain. Technology in green vehicles could be used to harvest information on drivers. This is a warning from ministers. Benedict. Yes, um, of course, this is all to do with everything being very smart now, is that uh, companies or state actors can harvest uh, data from almost any device, be it your car, be it your phone, be it your fridge. Uh, the important thing, I think, to take from this is, first of all, uh, the Chinese state doesn't really have a great deal of interest in the activities of the average British citizen. They, you know, they, they aren't interested in sort of converting us all to, to their way of thinking. The extent to which they might be interested would be to do with consumer data, like a company, how do you sell things to people? Where this might become uh, dangerous, nefarious, uh, is the fact that it can that devices like phones, for example, can be used not just to triangulate your position, but to triangulate other people's positions. So, for example, uh, dissidents, uh, foreign Chinese nationals, security uh, uh, workers, uh, civil servants, politicians, etc., journalists. There was a case earlier on in the UK this year of TikTok being used. Uh, by ByteDance, the company that owns it, to triangulate uh, the position of journalists to try and find out who was leaking information to them from within the company. So there are lots of sinister things that can be done with that. Of course, uh, having uh, a state have access to things like uh, road infrastructure also means that in the event that hostilities were to break out, were to break out they could uh, neutralize uh, the car network. But the key thing here actually to take about all of this is the UK is reliant on China. If the UK wants to get to net zero and it wants to phase out petrol cars, the buying of new petrol cars by 2030, we are entirely reliant on China. We do not have uh, an electric car industry of our own. We do not have the infrastructure as things currently stand, and we won't by 2030. American companies are not as far advanced as they like to say. Tesla being a big example, the distance of their vehicles just isn't there. And China, the state, 
has an almost monopoly on the raw resources that are needed to make these vehicles, things like lithium, things like cobalt. This is what they've been doing in Africa for a very long time, is buying up the rights to the mines. If this is what we are going to do, if this is the direction that we're going to go down, we have no real other options other than to deal with China, which, let's be clear, it is, in many instances, a hostile state. And that is something that I'm afraid Western countries have allowed to happen by allowing cheap Chinese labor to manufacture uh, the goods on which we now live our lives and by withdrawing from parts of the world to which we had a responsibility. Benedict, we're going to move on just so we can get one more story in. And this is the front page of the Mirror, Rachel. Uh, Jamie Oliver is um, calling for free school meals to be given to children all year round. Rachel. That's right. Um, there's been a new survey revealing that um, one in four secondary school children know someone their age who regularly skips meals and goes hungry. It is a reality across the UK that child hunger is a huge issue and is getting worse because, of course, the cost of living crisis is pushing up food wage, uh, food prices. And it is interesting, isn't it, that it's, it always seems to come down to celebrities to sort to to try and intervene. So now Jamie Oliver, who has campaigned around food um, and school meals before, of course, but in the past, Marcus Rashford, um, celebrities who seem to care more about these issues, bring publicity and public attention to them and force the government essentially into doing a key yes, part of its job. Do so, remember the uh, Marcus Rashford uh, campaign, the most uh, effective of those. We're going to have to end there. We have run out of time. Rachel and Benedict, thank you very much for the moment. We'll see you in an hour's time.